Greetings. I am legally obligated to inform you that I am limited in my YAP ability today. I lost the conditions of a certain agreement that I made, and thusly I have been placed under a binding vow. Such binding vow only allows me to YAP for twice the length of the original video. Thusly, with the original video being 12 minutes and 7 seconds in length, I am allowed to YAP for 24 minutes once I start the actual live reaction. This is quite limiting to me, but such binding vows are binding vows. So, let's do this. What's up guys, welcome to the here. We're going to do a breakdown, so this live reaction and analysis of Blazing Good Anime's Mega Me's Breakdown makes a lot of sense by Blazing Good Anime. And I'm very, very, very excited. Like I mentioned in the intro, I am under the pretenses of a binding vow, so I can't actually even do too much in the intro, so we cannot actually waste any more time. Just allow me to pull up this timer, which I probably also should have done before I even started recording, but a binding vow is a binding vow, and I'm going to abuse the limits of it as soon as I can, because the moment I start this video, I will only have two minutes and two 24 seconds to do my yapping and that bothers me <laughs> so that, hey hey kids if this is a lesson it's a lesson to not make binding vows that you aren't confident you can upkeep on your own end but let's not waste any more time let's hop right into it editing me are you ready three two one go with the most recent chapters i hear nothing there are already issues but i need to start the timer no with our main cost with the Hallelujah. most Hallelujah. As you can see, you cannot see. It it says two minutes and twenty four seven seconds. I'm already cheating. Binding vow initiated. Let's let's go. Recent chapters with our main cost on the cusp of successfully completing their mission to save Megami. A pivotal moment occurred when Megami said he's had enough. With this, the community have had their fair share of slander, <laughs> where they have clowned his decision to not helping the main cost in this life and death situation. In this video, I'll address the main critiques I've seen and whether Megami was wrong for saying he's had enough. The main three arguments I've seen are 1. Yuji got right back in Shibuya, so Megami should do the same. 2. We don't know enough about Sumiki, why do I care about Megami? And 3. Megami's decision may lead to the death of the students. Okay, I'm going to use my very limited yap time. I allowed him to get one minute into the video. This is not even... Okay, I need to hurry. Um, point number one. I'm going to counter all these points because I also... I agree with points again. Megami's breakdown does make a lot of sense, at least in my opinion. Number one, you just got right back up in Shibuya, so, so, so Megami should do the same. He didn't. He literally didn't. I mean, he did after the Shibuya massacre, but after he lost Nobara and Nanami, bro was, bro was going through it. So, of course, like, he knew those people for, what, six months? Less than that? Like, a fraction of a fraction of the fraction of the time? Like, Itadori barely knew those people, and afterwards, once he was... Once he lost them, he essentially gave up himself. So, no. Yuji didn't get back up. I love Yuji, but the reason I like him so much is because he didn't immediately get back up. It's because he had to be convinced. He had to be lifted up by the best brother in all of existence, Toto. Number two, we don't know enough about Samuki, so why do I care about Megami? I can only agree with this on, like, a meta-narrative level. I agree. Like, we do not know enough about Samuki. Samuki was not a character. She, literally, I don't, we've never actually, like, heard from Samuki. At least from the point that we see her in the modern narrative, unless I'm misremembering a flashback, it's always Yorozu. Like, legitimately always Yorozu. Never Samuki. So, unfortunately, we just do not have that. So I can understand why people don't care about Samuki, but Megami cares about Samuki. So it'd be like that when it'd be like that, especially when it'd be like that. If you don't care about Megami, I don't blame you. I don't really care about Megami too much either. So, <laughs> like, like, I can't really defend that point, but, like, still... It makes sense within the character. You can't necessarily use your own distaste for the character, not as a reason for why the character should do something else. For the final reason, Megami's decision may lead to the end of the students. Absolutely, yeah, I agree. That doesn't that doesn't change the character motivation behind why he decided to give up. So, like, I don't think any of these arguments are solid, but darn it, I'm already at 21 minutes. Let's let him rock. Now, I'll address all these arguments and then come to the conclusion in whether Megami was wrong for his decision. Number one. <laughs> Yuji got right back on pit Shibuya, so Megami should do the same. This is the easiest one to counter my opinion. The complete utter ignorance this statement <laughs> has brought really confused me from a group of people who have constantly seen Yuji being broken down in the manga while having numerous support groups to keep him afloat. Not only this, but the one thing Sukuna referenced that surpasses himself is his indestructible will to continue to push forward, making him the exception, not the rule of what it means to deal with hardship. 
But the biggest irony of the situation is that this moment in Shibuya is spearheaded by the repeated attacks on his psyche throughout the series, which starts at the fearsome womb arc. Now I know you may not remember this, as it has been a long time ago, but the moment Yuji's resolve was fully destroyed was against the finger bearer, where Yuji had burning desire to live, making the biggest mistake he'd ever do in the series, and that is relying on Sukuna. The naivety of this decision is understood, as he's a young kid who's been thrown into a life he truly wasn't ready to experience, but it sets up the motion for everything to go wrong. Sukuna uses Yuji as a hostage and this is the creation of the Enchained plotline that we have seen the repercussions from and this one move has caused all the events that have currently occurred and through that one honest mistake. So why the double standard? It would be stupid to critique Yuji's human decision in the moment of crisis. He is spitting right now, like definitively and actively spitting right now. Notably, like he didn't even bring up the just immediate fact that that's actually just wrong. <laughs> like at least for the Shibuya point, he didn't bring up the fact that that's just wrong. Like Yuji did not immediately get back up. That that's the easiest to feed into that first argument. But yeah, he he brings up the original original reason. Really, really think about it. If Yuji, well, admittedly, you, if we're if we're trying to trace the blame back to its earliest point, it's and once again, I haven't read the FW arc in a while, so I'm misremembering. But I, I think Gojo sent them on that mission, knowing it was a finger bear. Even though none of the students had any real experience against special grades. But I may be misremembering that. I think the finger bearer may have been a surprise, because I don't think they were ready for that. So, Gojo made the mistake by sending them on that mission and not going in there with him to supervise. But, obviously, yeah, he's right. The earliest point of blame goes to Yuji. Because Yuji is the one who made the deal with Sukuna. And that's what allowed Tsukuna to end up getting Megumi's body and the Cascade of events. So if you really want to place blame on somebody, it would be Yuji. He is correct on that one. Megumi, he ain't really at fault. And still, once again, the argument of itself is just inherently incorrect. Like, it, it just is wrong. Like, like, do you not remember the We Are the Exception scene? And he brought up a fantastic point to even think about. The whole idea that Tsukuna was the one to acknowledge the fact that Yuji Tadori is the exception, not the rule. And even then, Tsukuna's wrong in that aspect because Yuji did give up. He needed external help. So he's spitting right now, but I only have 18 minutes and I'm not that far into the video. Yeah, Megami is supposed to bounce back after his first major crisis when the events are even more personal to him. Not to mention, but the person who stepped up to try save Yuji in the first place was Megami, meaning he tried to make amends for his own lack of self-worth with initially fleeing from the finger bearer. But now that we've uncovered the first significant moment of Yuji's breakdown, let's go to the second moment and why this is pivotal to the Shibuya moment. Junpei, another character who's received his first <laughs> share of slander, but he's an important character to the development Yuji had during the Versus Mahito arc. Give people a good death. Confronted with his natural enemy Mahito, begins to poke at his psyche and push him to the extreme of his morals, which causes Yuji to have another crisis again. Choosing to give his entire life to Sukuna to protect one person highlights the rash decisions that can be made when your mentality has been challenged. The switch from Yuji wanting to exercise Mahito but now saying he wants to kill him is a primary example of his mentality being shaken. The importance of this is Yuji comes to reshape his resolve through Nanami's guidance in a similar manner Megami and Gojo helped him reshape his resolve after the death of Sukuna these moments can only be impactful after the character themselves come to terms with the decisions themselves. This leads to Yuji killing the transfigured humans over the sake of fulfilling his role in a cynical cycle of curses versus humans. Now we flash forward to Shibuya, post the loss to Chosa, Sukuna's rampage and the death of his mentor and friend Nobara. And Yuji is once again broken. We see Yuji give up and thanks to Todo's speech to reaffirm his resolve we see the impact it has on his character as the entire fight with Mahito, Yuji's coming to terms with him being just like Mahito. But what's the difference in these situation and Megumi? One, Yuji has someone to support him and come to terms with his decision and the constant trauma is then fully highlighted later in his clash with Higuruma. But Yuji also has the luxury of being the primary focus of the arc, which allows the events to flow quicker. In comparison, Megami's entire conflict has been mainly through subtext and the theme of karma playing an integral role in his character and the self-doubt he's had in himself 
which also contributed to his current situation. There's one thing I will admit. Once again, I'm trying to I'm trying to be efficient. I only have 15 minutes. Jeez. But he is right. He is spitting. One thing that I do think is a bad thing, though, and I think is still a, a, not necessarily a bad thing, but just a consequence of how JJK is written, the lack of time. It's that lack of time that has a lot of people breathing down Megavine's neck. Since it's so left up to subtext, and since it's so left up to things that are very rarely focused on, that are interspersed with a bunch of equally balanced character moments that are much more forthright, I do think, indirectly, Gege ended up doing Megami a disservice. By relegating him so much to a aspect of the narrative, and relegating his fundamental relationship that he has genuine ties to in Samuki as a background aspect of the narrative, I do think he did Megami a disservice. Because that is what essentially led to the world as we see it now if it wasn't for that if it wasn't for Megami being what feels like for the most part a background asset that has mostly been used in order to drive the plot forward which is what his role is and what every character's role is then I think people would be a lot more okay with it but since it's so much subtext since Samuki's barely a character even if it makes sense within the subtext and the actual text that is established it it's in the actual text that Megami loves the system more than anything else that is actual factuals but in spite of all that, I can understand why people still don't like it. Because Gage just didn't do a good enough job of dramatizing it and establishing it. I think it's still there. It's still done. Once again, he, Blaziken isn't reaching for straws or anything here. I only have 14 minutes. Blaziken is not reaching for straws here. He's being completely accurate. Once again, it's why I've been mostly just sitting here. Because there's nothing really for me to comment on in terms of like disagreement or anything like that. But I do think... A big issue with JJK is due to the high paced speed of the narrative and the lack of character emphasis, unless it's for characters that Gege really wants to put emphasis on, like your Makis, like your Yujis. Heck, I'd say like Yuda, but I don't really even really like Yuda. Yuda gets very little character reflection. He's mostly a perfect character, but we'll, we'll get to that another time. But with that being the case, I think Megami does suffer. And considering how important he's, he ended up being and how important he should be for round start as a deuteragonist, I do think he definitely should have gotten more. To make it more excusable and have people more ready for this. I only have 13 minutes. Jeez! But Megami is one, not had the same luxury of a primary focus on his character, as well as been sunk in evil and been on his own for a month. Nobody to support him, watch his body killed his sister and kill his benefactor, which has contributed to his will being broken. So how are these events even remotely similar when the payoff to these events reside in different aspects and Yuji has had multiple support groups to help him come to terms with his own resolve. Do people want characters to be the same, that they react to every situation similar? Or is agenda so strong that we can't engage in any genuine discussions about characters without understanding why they react in that certain way? The agenda is almighty. The agenda is all-powerful. We live, we rise, we breathe, we drink, we fall by the agenda. Welcome to Agenda Kaisen, where all we do is fight for agendas. I'm not kidding, let's see. Who's to say that someone you won't save won't kill someone in the future? Megami's arc is resolved on karma in a selfish mentality to save those he thinks are worthy. Karma playing the hand that the person who he saved contributed to him losing the reasoning he became a sorcerer in the first place, Sumiki, sets up for major payoff in his arc, but after being helped, he comes to reaffirm his own resolve. It also plays on that karma theme as well, with him saving both Hana and Yuji, who could be the two most important people in actually helping to save Megami himself. So the entire premise of Yuji did this, Megami should do that, without taking into account how different their stories are, doesn't make sense to me, and is a disservice to the character arcs Gege is creating for these two people. In conclusion, Argument 1 I cannot agree with, as it lacks all nuance and to restrict development of plot lines that has been set up from Origin of Obedience and the Fearsome Womb arc, it would be very inconsistent in Gage's writing. 2. Also, it's just wrong. He never actually, I, I am actually impressed that he just never addressed that it is wrong. <laughs> that, that usually did not immediately pop back up. But like, there's that too. But, let's keep going. We don't know enough about Sumiki for me to care about Megami. This one is a lot more interesting and really boils down to subjective opinion. But since this is me addressing arguments, I'll offer my perspective on the matter and compare it to another character in the series. Every bit of detail we get from Samiki is through the perspective of Megami, 
or through a flashback which is Megami centric. This is very intentional and continues to be a tragic story within his character arc but also replicates something similar in the Zenin clan and the theme of loss is very prevalent. We've seen that with Maki and Mai, Toji and self affirmation and even now you're in reaching a height that he believes he can. All of this is very prevalent within the Zenit clan and it's also shown through Megami as well. But with not diving in too much, before that we know from Sumiki is that she serves as a moral compass for Megami to what should be a good person. Even the panel choices showing Grey when Megami thinks about Sumiki shows how her standards contradicts to Megami's ideal and what is right and why the narrative constantly punishes him on not sticking true to his nature. What do I mean by the panel colour? Well, Curse and JJK are written in black panels and the fact that Sumiki always shown in the grey light black panels is to highlight in my opinion that Sumiki is a curse towards Megami and there's numerous occasions where it can be shown. In the Culling Games when he went to kill Remy, Sumiki is a limiting factor for him and restricts him being true to his own nature in which he without question removes someone who isn't aligned with his morals. Megami is a character whose highlight is his IQ and did not. That is an interesting aspect. Honestly, I, did, I never actually figured Sumuki as a curse. I always figured Sumuki as more a, I guess like an inverted blessing in the sense that her restriction of Megami's more baser instinctual desires led to positive and negative things. That's why I, that's why I believe she's consistently viewed in gray. She never has the full black background panels, never full white. The benefits of Samuki's ideology filtering into Megami have been good. They led to Yuji being saved. They led to Megami fighting for certain people and appearing as he did. Samuki has been a positive influence on Megami. Without Samuki, Megami would not exist, presumably. But at the same time, there have been the negatives that were born of that, such as saving Yuji. I, I always figured Samuki was like this... This double-edged blade, essentially. If you know, like, Backbiter from Percy Jackson, a blade that can harm both humans and monsters, Forge of Steel and Celestial Bronze. That's how I always viewed Tsumuki. Not necessarily a curse, but an inherent chain. A chain that could be used as a weapon to strike against others who would harm Megami, and at the same time, a chain that would weigh Megami down and prevent him from protecting himself and limiting him drastically. That's how... That's how my brain always rationalized it. But I, I do like the perspective of Sumuki just exclusively being a curse. And I have three minutes left, but eight minutes. Let's go. The connection that Sumiki ingesting a cursed object would result in a reincarnated player because of his care for his sister. Now, I'm not going to rumble, but you get the point that in moments where Megami fumbles significantly, his restricted mindset can be seen to be directly influenced by Sumiki. But why is this important? Well, Knowing who Sumiki is, in my personal opinion, shouldn't affect your perspective on the effects it has on Megami's character. And the fact that this is something shown only through Megami's perspective shows the significance she holds in his life. To take it to a step further, his entire reasoning for being a sorcerer was for his sister, as the Zenin clan is a terrible place for her to stay. And the result of his sister dying should be impactful if you care about Megami as a character. Now the comparison I want to draw is Yuta and Rika. We have more in-law story of showings of Rika, aside from the volume extra and then when the perspective when Yuta freed the curse didn't detract me caring about Yuta's struggle to connect with others in volume zero. I cared about- Okay, so <laughs> I, I do see what he's going for here and I even agree. Once again, I don't know, I find myself completely agreeing with Blaze again here. I have seven minutes. I completely agree with what he's saying so far. The thing that I think, the reason why people are getting on not caring about Samuki and what that leads to for Megami and not necessarily using Rika as a comparison or like saying, and he's using Rika as a counter comparison, right? We don't know much about Rika. Rika's a non-character. The most you get out of her as a character is she was nice to Yuta and she became his curse under Yuta's own full fruition and he let her go. There is that volume extra, but once again, that adds a little too late. <laughs> but I think the difference is Rika as a net Rika ends up as a net positive for Yuta. Samuki ended up as a net negative for Megami, since Samuki is the reason that Megami is allowing things to happen as they are, 
And that's fine. Once again, I agree with Blaziken. This works fantastically for the character. But, like, from a... If I'm trying to just look at it without caring about Megami's character, I'm just looking at how much investment and time did a character get proportional to their impact on the narrative. Megami in Samuki's impact is gargantuan for relatively little time spent on them. Samuki especially. As Samuki is the main cited reason for why Megami sunk in darkness. Gojo is not even necessarily mentioned as a reason his fall isn't. We assume that, we assume he was conscious, but we don't even know. It's mainly Samuki. So her being so integral to the way that the plot is now, I can understand why people don't like it, even if I agree with Blaziken's idea that that doesn't necessarily make sense, because we do have an equal comparison. The one ended up as a negative, one ended up as a positive. That's why I think people aren't hard on Rika and her lack of characterization. But let me see, I only have five minutes. Rika, left. because I cared about Utah. And the same principle works for Mick and me as well. Ghetto fans will hold the same testament to someone such as Mimiko and Nanako because we have very limited screen time of them, but people care about their deaths because they rate Ghetto. To put into perspective, time not- And that's another thing I don't care about. I do not care about Nanako and Mimiko. But then again, I also don't really care for Ghetto. I think Ghetto's neat and I like what he does for Gojo's character, but Ghetto as a character himself, while he's interesting, I don't actually care too much about the character. Which is why their, re their ends didn't really bother me. I was like, oh well, tough stuff, Mako. But let's see knowing who Samiki is doesn't detract from the moment because at the end of the day the person suffering is Megami which will always be impactful as a person of his character. However I can't be upset if someone wants more lore on the Samiki to make the result more impactful. Okay, but yeah, playing so on does. the theme of karma since origin of obedience Megami has been looking for a way to save his sister. With the knowledge we have of Kenjaku saying the sorcerers that ingested cursed objects were already dead, which means the entire Culling Game motivation was all for nothing, which is beyond tragic. Let fate toy with you till you die like a fool. This quote in tandem with Sukuna killing his sister with a reincarnated wacky sorcerer who's obsessed with Sukuna fully highlights that. And granted, it isn't the most appealing fight for the community, but it fully builds up on the karma aspect associated with Megami's character. Now this one, even though I personally disagree, I'm more understanding to this point of view because mm. I can see the vision for wanting to know some more about Sumiki, even though there could still be something in the future as we continue in the series. Yeah, even though I think this has been an intentional and needed route for Megami's character, who like Gojo, use another character as a guide for their moral compass. Three, Megami may lead the students to die. Now this is a take that's not only understandable, but is very fair and more than justified to lead into hate. But at the back of Megami's failure to help the gang and they all waste their efforts towards the fight against Sukuna, even me as the biggest Megami fan could not argue about this. Oh, okay, so, so more as the that. main focus is to save Megami, meaning the students can't take the greater step of eradicating him for the betterment of the world, in a similar manner such as Yuji, it would be more than valid take which would be very unfortunate reality. However, I'm very confident, fingers crossed, that the main students won't be dying anytime soon as there are bigger purposes at stake and with time, the delaying of this will lead to a beautiful character moment that will begin to start the next chapter in Megami's arc. So overall, is Megami wrong with his decision? I will firmly say no, as I think this is an important aspect that his character needs to go through. Okay, now that's where I disagree. Megami is wrong for leaving everybody behind. But the, the reason for why he is wrong is okay. That I disagree with. Once again, I will not... I'll give Megami the pass, because it makes sense for his character, but I will not give Megami... Like, Saying no is the wrong choice here. If he had said yes, and if he had taken Yuji's hand, if he had even recognized Yuji, and he had taken control of his body back, the whole conflict would be over. That is the right choice. Megami made the wrong one. So, while the breakdown and the denial and the wrong choice makes sense, it is still inherently a wrong choice. That I don't get defending. Because there is a one thing I disagree with Blaziken on. Let me see. Especially with the mental issues that have been prevalent in his character. It will also adds a well-needed plot tie into his relevance to Ensukuna with Yuji, and with the two characters being the most infected by the rampage of Sukuna and on a personal level. Overall, agenda aside, if you dislike Megami, I cannot hate your opinion on that as the way we view characters is subjective, but I at least like people to appreciate the reasons why certain plot points occur rather than the talk up to, he's a bum. <laughs> All right, and we end on that. All right. Fun fact. I do have it on me. I keep it on me at all times. And what's up, guys? That guy with a pencil here. I literally only have a minute and 40 seconds. W video. Once again, fantastic arguments. He tackled the main three that I've seen. He tackled them all effectively, and I really, really like it. 
Unfortunately, once again, I'm sorry, but I will I will react to more of your videos in my traditional style. I just lost the Binding Vow. And like they already gave me the other video of yours need to react to limitedly in order to complete the Binding Vow. So let's say I will be doing this. But uh, thank you so much for watching. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, please leave. Shh, I already did Shadowfall. <laughs> leave the broken child. The broken child. As I don't know what else you'd call it, Megami. That boy sure is broken, and that's definitely a child. But with that being the case, let me see. I have a minute left. I would like to thank you guys so much for watching. Please check out the original video. It'll be linked in the description down below, along with a link to Blazing Against Channel. He's amazing. Fantastic content creator. Great editing. Everything of the sort. If you want more JJK content, he does it. He posts consistently. Go check him out. I do thank you guys so much for watching. Please leave a like, share, comment, and subscribe. And make sure you hit that little case bell so you don't miss out on any videos that come to the channel. Also, also, I do happen to have a patron below where you can support me for as low as one, kind of one, down monthly things like exclusive videos, early content, and more. And also, I become a member of the channel for as low as three dollars a month to get the same perks and more. Some of the perks will include the live reaction to the very next chapter of Jujutsu Kaisen, along with ad free variations of all my videos. And if you go a $25 patron or a $25 member, you can order whatever video you want. Now, I'd like to thank you so much for watching. Once again, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. This is that guy with 16 seconds left riding off. I'd like to give a thank you to our three dollar members Connor Plays, Greyhound, Akids Void, Astro, Red Wolf 4765, and Eternal Flame. And I'd like to give another thank you to our five dollar patrons Victor, Steron, Sean, RNG Master, Midnight Lord 21, Metal Solid Crisis, Kevin, Igneo, and Ehack One. And I'd like to give a gargantuan thank you to our seven dollar members Autumn Mornings Lazo and Jan Tomaz. And I'd like to give another juicy old thank you to our $10 member, Jay Warrior. I'd like to give a gargantuan thank you to our two $10 patrons, Joaquin and Idemokami. And I'd like to give another sloppy thank you to our, <laughs> I shouldn't have said thank you to our $25 member, Alex Ice Rose. And I'd like to give a juicy gargantuan thank you to our $25 patron, Winter. Another Fantastic next level thank you to our $25 patron, China Doll09, and a final gargantuan thank you to our $25 patron, Calvin Elder.